All right, so this Christmas season, we're going to go through a, uh, a bunch of Old Testament prophecies that talk about the coming of Christ. And we're going to do that because I want you to see that, that Christmas was not an afterthought on God's behalf. All along, God had planned to save us. And so we're going to look at some texts in uh, Genesis. We're going to look at a text in, I believe it's Deuteronomy. We're going to go to Isaiah. We're going to, we're going to be in the Old Testament throughout our Christmas season. There's some 300 prophecies. We're not going to cover them all. 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that refer to the coming of Christ. And I read some statistic about how astronomically impossible it is that any one person could fulfill even 10 of those prophecies exactly, and Jesus fulfilled them all. What we're trying to do is we're trying to show that um, the Bible is accurate. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to the very first prophecy, which is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Now, what we want to see here is that these prophecies were not obscure prophecies. This isn't a matter of Christians reading back into the Old Testament and seeing Jesus there. The Jews themselves understood that these were prophecies related to the Messiah. Do you remember when the wise men came to Herod and they said, where is he who was born, the king of the Jews? And Herod got his scholars together? Well, they knew that in the book of Micah, it said that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. They knew it. That, that they grew up understanding that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem, the town of David. So these prophecies are all very well understood by Jewish people. They just missed the fact that Jesus fulfilled these things. Now this particular prophecy is interesting because it takes place in the Garden of Eden. And we live in a day when there's lots of people who say, well, that, that stuff's not true. The Garden of Eden, that's just, a, that's just a mythical story that really didn't exist. There really was nobody named Adam and Eve. That this, this, just, this just a story. Well, the problem with that is that Jesus refers to Adam and Eve as actual people. Remember when he talked about marriage? He talked about marriage being um, personified in the way that God created Adam and Eve to leave their father and mother and to be joined to their spouse so that the two will become one flesh. He went and talked about Adam as a historical figure. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans talks about the fact that as in Adam we have all died because Adam sinned and so all of us are tainted with the sin gene, so in Christ all will be made alive. That analogy doesn't work if Adam and Eve weren't real people. So the Bible is viewing this as a historical account. That's what we're going to do too because I believe that makes sense. Most of you know the story um, that God creates Adam and uh, then Adam looks for somebody to be a helpmate with him and he interviews all the animals. He gives them all names but he comes away going, ah, none of these are really... You know, the dog was kind of nice, but really it's just, not, it's just not what I want it to be. And so God tells him to take a nap, and he wakes up, and he sees Eve. And, and I believe what he said was, whoa, man. And he says, that's what I'm going to call her. Whoa, man. And come on, really? Doesn't that make sense to you? This, I'm going to name her Woman. That's not what it is at all. It, it's Adam sees this, whoa, man, and just gets really excited. Now this, this is the partner you created for me. And God puts them in the Garden of Eden, an idyllic place where he walks with them. I don't know how that worked, but it says that God would fellowship with them. And he says, I, I've created this huge garden and all these trees, which apparently were fruit trees, and he says, you can eat from any of them you want. I provide it abundantly for you, except don't eat from that tree that's in the middle. Now that raises a question, doesn't it? Why did God even put that tree in the middle of the garden if he didn't want them to eat it? Did God not know they were going to eat from it? Was God surprised when they chose to eat that fruit? No, God's all-knowing. He knows what's going to happen. 
This is what's called in theological circles the problem of evil. Where did evil come from? Why is evil there? And there's all kinds of people who think they've got the answer to this, but, but they don't. It is, a, it is an extremely complex problem. <laughs> I don't have the answer for it either, so if you're hanging on the edge of your seat, just relax because there's no reason to be tense because I don't have the answer either. R.C. Sproul, who's uh, one of my favorite theologians, says this. He says, here's all we know. We know that evil is bad, that when evil takes place, God judges it, and he holds us accountable for it. But what we also know is that God is fully in control, and God would not have allowed evil to exist if there was not some good purpose for it. I don't know what that good purpose is, but somewhere along the line, God had a plan. So anyhow, the, the serpent comes along, and some people say, well, the whole serpent story is just to show how come none of us like snakes. Now, there are some weird people who do like snakes, but you're just sick. Um, <laughs> You know, snakes are creepy, uh, creepy, slimy, ew. Um, so anyhow, so the serpent appears and, and tempts Eve. And the way he does that is by impugning God's character, basically is what he does. He said, did, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And Eve adds something here. God said you can't eat from the tree, but Eve says you can't, you, you can't eat from the tree, you can't even touch it. God, boy, it, serious stuff. And then... The devil says, God said that you're going to die, but you're not going to die. See, the truth is, he just doesn't want you to be as smart as he is. And so Eve thought, hmm, that makes sense. And she eats. Now, another question comes in, where did this serpent come from? Where did Satan come from? Who is he? Most people believe that based on um, Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28, there are passages there that talk about the fall of Lucifer, um, a, 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 an angel who apparently uh, was not content to remain a servant of God and instead rebelled, wanting to take over, have a little coup, and God kicked him out of heaven because an angel who was created is never going to supplant the one who is eternal. But Satan didn't care. And so what most people believe happened was that Satan was kicked out of heaven and he took a third of the angelic host, which now we know as demons. So Satan's kicked out of heaven. He brings his army with him. And now his goal is to undermine the rule of God, especially in those that God has created. So he comes in and he's trying to uh, defeat Adam and Eve. He's trying to ruin the relationship that they have with God. I don't know why. I don't know why God didn't just wipe Satan out right at the beginning. But again, there must be a good reason why God has allowed him to remain. So, Adam and Eve are part of this spiritual battle. They don't even realize it. They're part of a spiritual battle. A supernatural thing is going on here between God and Satan. They are not equal. But Satan is seeking to undermine all that God does. We're told that Adam and Eve immediately knew shame. They knew that they were naked. I guess before that time, it, it was just the way it was. But now all of a sudden, they feel exposed. They feel uh, vulnerable. And the first thing that happens is they hide from God. Now, the story goes on here, and, and we see this promise that comes in uh, Genesis, well, let me read you Genesis 3, 13 through 15, which is really where the focus of our study is going to be. Verse 13, the Lord asked the woman, what have you done? And she blames the serpent. The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Then the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live does that raise a question for you? What was the serpent like before the curse? If the curse was that he was going to crawl on his belly, what was he like before that? Huh, interesting question. I don't have an answer for that one either. 
verse 15, this is the key. This is the verse that, that's the key verse. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, a descendant of Eve. He, that descendant, will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Everybody believes, Christians believe, Jews believe, that this was a promise of a coming Messiah, a descendant of Eve that would take on Satan and defeat him. That descendant was Jesus. Now, I want you to see what happens here. Understand the impact of what sin does. This, this one sin. This, we say it was just a little sin. They just, they just ate from the apple. It wasn't an apple. It doesn't say it's an apple. It says fruit. Ate fruit. So whatever it is they ate. They ate from this fruit. It was just a bite of fruit. No, it wasn't. It was an act of treason. It was an act of saying, God, we don't trust you. We will not submit to you. We do not believe in your character. We believe you're trying to force us into slavery. Hmm, that's a lot to say with one bite of fruit, isn't it? And the result of this is palpable. The relationship between God and us is now stained. Think about the most uh, damaging thing that can happen to a relationship in this life. Nothing compared to what happened in the garden. The relationship between God and man now is affected. Adam and Eve, who used to walk with, with God in the garden, are now hiding they don't want anything to do with him. They're afraid of God now. Second, we see that the relationship between Adam and Eve is affected. <laughs> you see what, what Adam does right off the bat. God holds him accountable, and Adam, the wimp, says, it was her fault that, whoa, man, you gave to me. This, not just is it her fault, it's your fault. The only person who's not to be blamed here is me. <laughs> that didn't go so well. In the, the verses that follow, we're told that Adam and Eve would constantly be struggling, that there would be a tension between men and women, that there would be this struggle that is the consequence of sin. We see this ripple effect of what happens. Adam and Eve rebel against God. And then as you read through the Bible, oh, man, their kids, Cain and Abel, they go out and they, they worship God one day. They offer a sacrifice. Abel's is, is pleasing to God. Cain's is not. So Cain decides, well, I don't like this. God likes him better than me. So he killed his brother. The next guy down the line now starts marrying more than one woman. Abraham even, Father Abraham, lies about his wife being his wife. He says she's his sister, so that nobody will bug him. So his sister gets ta taken into the king's residence. What kind of a wimpy guy is he, right? And even when Noah comes along, we, we read that every inclination of the human heart was evil. The ripple effect of sin is great. And then there's the, uh, the devil, who now is forced to be on his belly, whatever that means, and he becomes our antagonist for the rest of life. Satan's job was to, um, Satan's mission, I shouldn't say it was his job, that makes it sound like it's from God. Satan's mission is to undermine us. Satan seeks to uh, attack us, and we saw this in the Old Testament, but even the New Testament, listen to some of the things that happened there. When Jesus came on the scene, Satan turned up the heat. He tried to label Mary as an immoral woman so she would be killed. He had Herod try to kill baby Jesus. He tempted Jesus in the wilderness to compromise. He sent demons to expose him. He enticed Judas to betray him. He incited the religious leaders to oppose him. He moved the Jews to kill Jesus for the good of the nation. Satan wanted to beat Jesus. He wanted to wipe him out. Satan struck his blow, and we know that. When Jesus was crucified, when he was beaten, when he was killed, Satan thought he won. 
Wouldn't you have hated to be the demon who had to come to uh, Satan on that first Easter? Um, Satan? Um, <laughs> you're not going to believe this. He's back. Jesus is back. Satan realized at that point that the battle was essentially over. We're still struggling. There's still this skirmish, but he knew that he was defeated. God had taken his best punch and had trumped him. I want you to see a few things from this account and as we apply this to our own lives. Number one, notice that Adam and Eve deserve death. They deserve to die. God told them, you eat from the fruit, you die. And yet, Adam lived some 900 years. Even then, God had a plan of redemption in mind. Uh, we read the story that God gave them skins to cover them. Skins. Of what? Of animals. Up until this point, there had been no death. Up until this point, there was no killing. Up until this point, even the animals were living at peace with each other, kind of like the picture we have of what's going to happen in heaven. And these animals were killed. And Adam and Eve, I suspect, had to watch, and they saw the horror of the consequence of sin as these animals were butchered so that they could wear their skins. And they were cast out of the garden. You got to leave. You can't stay here. People today are looking for the Garden of Eden. Where's the Garden of Eden? Okay, and let me remind you that there was a worldwide flood in the time of Noah. Garden of Eden isn't going to be found by anybody, it's been washed away. So they didn't die immediately. After hundreds of years, they did die. And we say, well, see, they, they still died. They didn't die spiritually because of what God did. In fact, they needed to die physically because as the effects of sin begin to accumulate in our society, and, and that's what's happening, the effects of sin are accumulating and life is becoming more and more unbalanced because sin wrecks the harmony of creation that God had this perfectly harmonious world in which we lived. And then sin came and it threw the balance off. And ever since then, there's been this consequence that's been building and we need to die because it's the only way we can escape the corrupt body that we now have if God did not take the life of Adam and Eve if he did not take us apart from the Lord coming and, and carrying us to himself it would be like people who were condemned to live in a nursing home for hundreds of years can you imagine how horrible that would be? So even the death of Adam and Eve became an act of mercy and of grace. God could have destroyed them, but he didn't. The second thing I want you to see is that um, Paul talks about that when Adam sinned, what happened was the sin gene was, if you will, passed on to us. And we were all impacted. Nobody else was able to live in that perfection that Adam and Eve had. We were all polluted with sin. And it was inevitable that we were going to follow the path of Adam. But Paul says when Jesus came on the scene, that one man, what he did, was possible made possible to undo everything that happened with the one man, Adam. That Jesus made it possible for us to be right with God again. And so it's, a, it's an amazing thing that now, because of Jesus, we can be made righteous with God again. We can return to that standing that Adam and Eve originally had. Third, this text reminds us that we are in a spiritual battle. All those temptations that you and I have, understand that that's not just us being, you know, uh, corrupt people. Satan is working on us. There is a battle going on for our hearts and our lives and our allegiance. Fourth, we see a graphic example of the ripple effect of sin. 
all the bad stuff that we address in prayer, all the things that cause us pain, the broken relationships, the cancer, the leukemia, the Parkinson's, the Alzheimer's, the heart disease, all that stuff is a consequence of the ripple effect of sin. Now, I'm not saying that those people who have those things are being punished for sin. Understand that, that tornadoes and tsunamis and earthquakes, all this stuff has come because the Bible tells us the balance of creation has been destroyed by the sin of men. And until that day when a new heaven and new earth is created, which is the only way to purge this world of the sin and the corruption that's here, until that day, we will feel the ripple effects of sin. And as we look around and we see the pain and we come to God and we say, Lord, why are you doing this to me? There's a sense in which the Lord can say to us, I'm not doing this to you. You as a creation have done this to yourselves. I am here to rescue you. That leads me to the last thing that we need to understand that the plan of salvation is not a backup plan. Get this. That, that it wasn't that, that God said to Adam and Eve, oh, whoa, didn't see this coming. What are we going to do now? How am I going to redeem these people? The book of Ephesians tells us that God chose us in Him before the creation of the world. Before the creation of the world. Before we ever sinned, God already had a plan to make us new. Isn't that amazing? The Christmas is, is the story of God affecting His grace to us. That we deserve to be cast aside. We deserved it. We deserve it every day for God to say, enough. But God did not cast us aside. God provided a way out. He provided a Savior. God is amazing. And even in this first prophecy, we see the heart of our Creator, that He loves us more than we can possibly imagine. So let me draw some quick conclusions. First, I think we need to learn that sin is not a toy. It's nothing to play with. You hear people all the time saying, ah, I'm not hurting anybody but myself. That's not true. It's never true. The ripple effect of sin impacts everybody. Every time we rebel against the Lord, we, we cause that wave to get higher and to, um, to destroy even more. Second, we learn that God is more loving than we can possibly grasp. God's uh, plan of redemption was not something that the church came up with. It's something that he had in store for us from the very beginning. Think about what the birth of Jesus meant. It meant the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. The rescue plan of God was finally implemented. This was the one that had been promised from the creation of the world. Jesus was God's solution to the sin problem, which, of course, is the, is the core of every other problem there is. Jesus was God's rescue plan. He was the one that will make it possible for us someday to have this mess all unraveled. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, we read this, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth and by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Which leaves us to a challenge. The challenge is for us to put our faith in this Jesus. 
Since he's God's rescue plan, it is foolish for us to ignore this. It is foolish for us to diminish what God has done. This isn't just about redeeming us personally. Understand that. We say, well, I've made Jesus my personal Savior. He didn't come just to be our personal Savior. He came to be the Savior of all creation. Romans 8 says, all creation groans waiting for the day of redemption. If we learn anything from the Genesis account, it's that we don't need to tweak God's plan of redemption. Our job is to receive the one who has come and to do so gratefully. Are you suffering today? Suffering from diseases, allergies, chronic conditions? Are you sore from arthritis? Are you feeling the sting of a fractured relationship or battling some besetting addiction? Do you feel tossed aside by the world? Do you feel distance between you and God? All of these things are the result of mankind's sin. Medicines, counselors, good works, and exercise are good, but they only address the symptoms. The one who alone can treat the core problem is Jesus. And that's where we need to turn first for ultimate healing. That healing may not take place in this life, but it will happen ultimately because of God's incredible grace. What you suffer, every ache we feel, is a reminder that we need a Redeemer. So at the start of this Advent season, I pray that you will open your heart to the life of the one who came to rescue you. Cry out to him, adore him, follow him. Tell others about him this Christmas. Rely on him. Don't just repeat the story. Understand the story. Turn to him for forgiveness, new life, and a new beginning. We desperately need the one who came in Bethlehem, the one who crushed the head of Satan, the one who came to set us free. So let's pray. Father, it's hard for us to comprehend the fact that one simple act was able to cause all the trouble that we see today. And yet we understand that your world is perfect and we have messed it up. And we continue to do so every day. We continue to question your heart, your wisdom and your love for us. We continue to think that somehow you're beating us up when in reality you're trying to save us. Father, thank you for Jesus. Because of him, we have hope. What an advantage we have over the uh, Jews, over those who for years were hearing the promises but had no idea how they would be fulfilled. We see it. We know it was Jesus. We know that the one who came in Bethlehem came to set us free. So now help us to believe, to hold on to him with everything we've got, and to allow your spirit to do the work of making us new. Help us to this end, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.